Store Manager here at Snakes Flagship Showroom. Thank you for coming tonight. Just a very few housekeeping bits. The bathroom is right there without a sign on it. Such a beautiful door, we didn't want to ruin it to the side. The fire escape is that way. <laughs> in the very unlikely event of anything going wrong tonight, apart from obviously the fire escape through the front doors that you came in. Thank you for, for coming tonight. I hope you enjoyed the Prosecco and the organic parmesan from Snake's family farm on Um I'm sure it's going to be a great debate tonight. I'm going to pass straight over to Sylvia now. Thanks again for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming to our Guild Autumn Debate, What Should We Eat Now? Um, a crucial question for a world in crisis. Um, I'm sure we're all acutely aware, probably more than ever before, that every purchase, every mouthful of food, and indeed how we prepare it and treat it, impacts not only on, on our well-being, but that of the planet. And food is also our, everyone here, our professional, core professional concern. How do we advise, how do we guide our readers, our listeners? We're all assailed, well I am anyway, by conflicting advice. Is there any baseline of truth? To whom do we turn? So of course we've assembled an expert panel and chair tonight, and between them they have many years of research and wisdom. They may have differing views. They may come to, uh, I hope, some kind of really good guidance consensus. Um, and Jeff will guide them to it. Before I leave Jeff to introduce our speakers, I'd just like to note that we are live streaming to Facebook, and Paul Belton is there, is very kindly doing this for us. Uh, that means we may have questions from our uh, forum, our Guild of Food Writers Forum at some stage, and Paul will pass those to the chair. They will be included in our discussion. Uh, we also have John, as ever, faithfully videoing everything for us, so you'll be able to see it afterwards. And uh, we hope that Dan Saladino is on his way to do a little bit of recording for the food programme, so you may hear a little bit of that there. Uh, now, Jeff, I'm sure, needs very little introduction. I'll give half a, half a moment to him, however, uh, because I, I served under his, his very uh, benign and wise um, leadership for a while when the Guild of Food Writers had a food policy subcommittee. Um, I don't know quite how much we achieved, but we certainly got many conversations going. Uh, I remember the GM debates very, very clearly. Uh, Jeff has many, many accomplishments under his belt. Um, uh, I should say, actually, that, that two of our speakers at least have won the um, Derek Cooper, Guild of Food Writers Derek Cooper Award for investigative reporting and writing, uh, and one of them is Jeff, of course. And he runs, very importantly, the Open Access Food Systems Academy, which is online. Uh, everybody can access it. If you haven't, please do so afterwards. Um, right, over to Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. And welcome to our speakers. Um, we're talking about the challenge of the great transformation really in our food systems, both globally and locally. We've got climate change, we've got loss of biodiversity and agricultural biodiversity, rising levels of inequality and household food insecurity in the UK. Um, poor wages and conditions are for people and often animals that are used in our food system, as well as enormous health costs from the way it currently runs, which outrun the costs produced by agriculture, the GVA gross value added in agriculture in many places. So there's a big set of things to address. And we're going to start where we mostly do start here, in the kitchen, and with cooking, and we're going to move out into the world as we go through the uh, discussion. And the first speaker tonight is Dr. Christian Rellen, Roy, Dr. Christian Reynolds, who is from the University of Sheffield. He has the grand title of a Knowledge Exchange Research Fellow, and he's now going to go and exchange some knowledge with us He's been focusing on food waste and sustainability and what you can do in the kitchen and how you cook. And you have eight minutes starting now. Thank you very much. So good evening everybody. My name is Christian Reynolds. I'm from the Institute of Sustainable Food. And tonight we're talking about what we should eat now. And today or tonight I'll be actually thinking about maybe what we should cook now rather than just what we should be eating now. And just for a little bit of an introduction, um, I live in Sheffield, as you can probably guess from work at the University of Sheffield, and I'm mostly vegetarian, but when I do eat animals or plant-based things, they're locally sourced. So if I'm getting meat, it's from Yorkshire, from ethically uh, 
uh, sort of places. My milk is from a local dairy herd called Al Cow Molly, which supplies the entire University of Sheffield with local milk within five miles, which is pretty amazing. Um, also at the same point, a lot of my food is rescued. And by that I mean it comes from a food rescue organisation which previously was called the Real Junk Food Project Sheffield but has now been rebranded as Foodworks. And I pay £12 a week which goes uh, towards a soup kitchen and other various activities and they in return give me a box of food that was rescued from other supermarkets that was past its best before or used by. And there are similar things such as odd box happening in London as well. So this is something that could be happening around there. And I'm also a multicultural, possibly modern cook, and I thought it would be fun to say the last three meals I've cooked, it was uh, Mapo Tofu from uh, Fuchsia Dunlop's Every Grain of Rice. Who's got that cookbook? Yeah! Have you guys got together the community cookbook? So I did a uh, Wat, uh, a good, really good Ethiopian curry, and then finally um, I did a dessert from Simple, which is again a real great modern classic. I just thought I would say, you know, we're all cooking from different sources and have different backgrounds there. So the big challenge we're probably talking tonight is that we need more crop production with the same amount of land and there's a gap at the moment. There's a gap between what we're currently producing and where we need to be in terms of population growth, as just been said. And with that, and my lens of sustainability I'll be looking through is greenhouse gas emissions, which is one of the big ones in terms of anthropogenic climate change. And this is a great graph from WRI, which is a um, not-for-profit from the States, and it's basically looking at the different things that they've projected we need to do to meet the uh, Paris targets, um, considering the amount of increases in population production, etc. And that little bit of red there is shifting diets, and that's the biggest of the other changes besides production assumption. <coughs> so just as an example, there are lots of different things we need to be doing in terms of agriculture, but shifting diets and shifting to different sorts of demand systems is one of them. And one of the great things that happened at the start of this year, and I'm sure Tim will talk about this later, is the Eat Lancet report. It was a really great big, um, report looking at a global dietary shift, how we as a planet have to start changing our diets. I'm sure a lot of the different panelists will be referring to that later. A real basic summary of that is saying we need to be increasing our fruits and vegetable consumption and decreasing our animal products. Now, sorry about this, Tim, a really brief critique. And I am a big fan of the Eat Lancet, and I think there's a lot of different um, value in that. However, it didn't talk about country-specific context and cultural-specific context, but it wasn't supposed to do that. However, it did have a limited discussion of cooking. You look for cooking, you look for the word cooks in that, they appear five times. So where is cooking within this document? And it wasn't the focus of this document, but there's a discussion we can have in this forum tonight, I think, around what we should be cooking now. And I think this is where the Guild of Food Writers can help. You design the recipes, you think about and communicate how we should be actually eating and cooking tonight. And I think this is totally under-researched. So rather than what we should eat now, before we go into the global system, where should we should be getting food, let's have a think about how we actually cook in the kitchen, how we design those recipes, and what we're actually talking to people about. So part of my research at Sheffield is looking back through the last 40, 50 years of cookbooks, and I found 23 which claim to be sustainable cookbooks. That's quite interesting. A lot of them are, say, diet for a small planet back in the 1973, and then there's a huge gap until the late 90s, um, 97, 98, when the Kyoto Protocol and stuff was coming out, climate change, sustainability came back, and you can see the modern ones around on this thing. And the reason is, cooking actually matters. And cooking matters for a couple of reasons. Cooking is related to household energy use. And the energy use in the household is related to negative climate impact through energy generation. As we decrease our reliance on fossil fuels, that will change. And at the moment, for instance, it's more efficient energy-wise to cook on gas than electric. But as we continue in the next couple of years, that's going to be flipping quite shortly. Um, at the same point, the way you cook your food changes the nutrients within it. If you pick a carrot from the field, you wait a couple of days, the nutrients, sugars change inside that carrot. If you boil that carrot to death, as we all know, great British cuisine of kind of the stereotypical thing, if you're boiling for 30 minutes, the nutrient content within that carrot changes, and the environmental impacts of boiling for 30 minutes are quite drastic compared to, say, steaming lightly, microwaving, or, God forbid, oven baking. Um, and also, at the same point, you've got gender use, time rolls, and this is a really big part of thinking in terms of the developed world or how we actually cook. Are we taking instant ready meals and microwaving them? Getting delivery and getting things from outside the house and bringing them in where somebody else's energy 
Or are we actually just looking at cooking in there and shackling ourselves to different ways of cooking? And so I think this is the last thing in terms of sustainable diet. So let's talk about it first tonight. Let's talk about what should we be cooking, how should we be cook cooking and changing things. So there are lots of different environmental impacts per gram of protein, per kilogram, etc. So two minutes, brilliant. Um, so in terms of looking at it as a per gram of protein thing, again, this is a graph from WRI, um, each of the different ways of cooking per minute have a different type of energy use. And so the thing I was pointing out here is if you're looking at broiling, grilling, or oven-based cookery, those are drastically higher than cooking the same type of food within a microwave, within a steamer, within a slow cooker, within a pressure cooker. So if you're thinking about how to design a recipe to be more sustainable, think about going for lower carbon options of cooking, which are different in terms of that, or producing a hybrid. And I'll just go to a quick point to finish up with. Um, so this is just a, a little bit of a description across a lot of different things, and it's usually around 5 to 10% of cooking's impacts are on uh, across the board. So with a meat meal, it's down about three or four percent is cookery impacts. But if you get to a vegetarian or another sort of meal, it can go up to five to ten. And the reason this matters is because current food systems seem to have about five to ten percent of cooking. But if you do some dietary modelling and include cooking impacts, if you move towards a more healthy, sustainable diet, such as the Lancet, that could go to 20 or 30% of the impacts if we don't also start changing our energy supplies and also start changing how we do that cooking, if we're doing business as usual. So this is something I did when I moved to Yorkshire. I thought, can we hack a roast beef in Yorkshire pudding to make it more sustainable? And the answer is yes. You can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of roast beef and Yorkshire pudding by about half. And that's through a combination of portion control and actually using sous vide, followed by actually then doing a panacea or doing a light roast afterwards. So you're changing the cooking method to be a much lighter thing, uh, which is using less energy, about the power of a light bulb, followed by doing a flash thing, um, which you co-cook co with your Yorkshire pudding. So there's ways you can hack different recipes if you want to try that. So we can change how and what we um, cook to combat climate change. So let's get cooking together. I'm really happy to take more questions um, via email. And we've got a website, gg.org, which is where you put a lot of data. And hopefully by next year, we'll have a tool online where you can paste in any recipe you have, and it will give you back the carbon footprint of it. So you can actually start comparing different methodologies of that. Thank you very much, and good night. Hi, I'm Dan Our next speaker tonight is Joanna Blythman, who I really don't need to introduce tonight. Uh, Joanna has done so many things over the years, journalist, writer, author, uh, winner of prizes, etc. And uh, over to you, Joanna. And uh, Christian is finally going to become a microphone stand for the next bit. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, we're currently being encouraged to eat less meat, fish, fowl, dairy foods that have sustained diverse populations around the planet, including ours, for millennia. And some people are even telling us to stop eating these traditional foods. Um, yesterday, for example, the Green Party announced that it wants to tax them. Um, and according to this school of thought, unless we make this unprecedented shift, the planet will crash and burn. Now, I, like all of us here tonight, I'm a food writer, and without being cocky, I think we can all say that, that those of us in this room know more about food than the average person. We think most, more deeply about it. We are professionals, and we're specialists. In other words, we have a heightened understanding of food production and its preparation. So it's our, I, it's our job to interrogate new ideas about diet and to hold them up for examination. So this is what I've done with the plant-based concept. And my conclusion is that I certainly won't be adopting that, and I won't be recommending that anyone else should do. And uh, let me talk you through why. Um, the first issue for me is human health. Um, an omnivore diet can guarantee that we get all the macro and micronutrients our bodies need in a bioavailable form. By that, I mean we can easily absorb them. So meat, for instance, provides us with high quality protein. That is to say, it's all the protein in the right amino acid profile with all the right essential amino acids. And a near perfect balance of fats, vitamins, and minerals. 
Now compare that to a vegan diet. Unless you take a supplement or eat an awful lot of vegan processed foods with added synthetic vitamins, you won't get enough vitamin B12. This is because, and let me quote Harvard Medical School here, there are no known plant foods that are natural sources of B12. And it continues, research shows that vegans who don't take a B12 supplement often have inadequate B12 levels. Um, as you know, the vegans are also quite likely to become deficient in other micronutrients that are important, like choline and zinc. The richest sources for them are animal sources. Now, for me, any diet that automatically leaves you deficient in essential micronutrients, a diet which by definition is not nutritionally complete enough to sustain healthy human life, is just an odd starter. But what about a plant-based diet, though? It doesn't sound so extreme as a vegan diet, so it looks more plausible. Well, let's look at the Eat Lancet plant-based diet. It's currently the sort of walking, talking uh, model for plant-based. The first surprise here is that it isn't actually a vegetable-rich diet. In fact, it tells us to get only 3% of our calories from vegetables. We're recommending that half of what we consume should come from wheat, grains, and soya. However, it does drastically restrict animal foods. It allows us, for example, only one and a half eggs each week, not day, each week, and not more than a daily mouthful of red meat. Now, Dr. Zoe Harkham, who I rate highly, has analyzed the diet using the US government reference values for micronutrients. And she concludes that if we followed it, we'd become deficient not only in vitamin B12, but also in vitamins D3, K2, potassium, sodium, calcium, heme iron, and essential fatty acids. And lots of other people have pointed out we'd also go short, sorry, Christian, on choline. Now, I want to stress this important point. One of the big problems about trying to get all your nutritional requirements from plant foods is that unlike animal foods, the micronutrients they contain are not so bioavailable. For example, Calcium absor absorption from spinach is only 5% compared to 27% for milk. And this is because animal foods don't have what we call the anti-nutrients, uh, things like phytates and oxalic acid. So bear in mind that the proponents of Eat Lancer are also pushing it as a universal, I'm quoting here, universal healthy reference diet, diet, which is applicable to everyone everywhere. Yet fast ways of the world population suffer from undernutrition. Now, I remember me meeting women tea pickers in Darjeeling, and we were discussing fair trade, and I asked them what they spent the fair trade premium on, this extra money that they got. And they said their dream was to own a cow. And the reason they have a cow is the cow would give them manure for their plants, they would get milk from the cow, and eventually, when the, kids, uh, when the, when the, the, the cow was too old, they would get meat. Um, and when ideologues in affluent countries pressurise poor countries to eschew animal foods and to adopt plant-based, to my mind they're displaying crass insensitivity. Such advice can only worsen the, nut the nutritional status of those populations. So that's my problems uh, with the nutritional side. I'd like to come to the traditional side. I mean, it starts staring obvious to me that the ultra-processed food we started eating in the last 60 years, that is what is driving diet-related ill health, and not the traditional whole foods that, in their natural forms that we've been eating for a long, long time. Yet, one of the ironies of adopting a plant-based diet is that most people will end up eating more processed food and less natural food. The other day, for instance, I heard a plant-based cook saying she used, quotes, high-quality sunflower spread instead of butter in a traditional cake recipe. But such a, a spread is otherwise known as margarine, one of the most heavily processed of all, foods of all. Give me our native butter any day. <laughs> Another weird thing about going plant-based is that you consequently have to turn your back on most of the foods that the UK is best at producing. Why? Because meat, dairy, eggs and, f and fish from our seas are the foods that we produce best. Um, and obviously you'll be clocking up more food miles. Now, to me, this is a form of cognitive dissonance. Surely we should put on our plates food that reflects the, re the productive capacity of our land. Surely we should favour foods produced to us as close to us as possible and give them pride of place on our plates. 
And to me, there's something really perverse about characterising jackfruit that's imported in a tin from Thailand, mm -hmm. or a genetically modified fake meat bur burger dreamed up by venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. To deem that is more accept acceptable than a lamb chop from a British hillside. But as part of its, quotes, great food transformation, eaten at last, it would necessarily tear up the multiplicity of food cultures around the globe and replace it with a monocultural, globalised one centred on factory food. Eat Lancet would stamp out distinctive and diverse food cultures that have evolved over time and are predicated on local history, seasons, traditions, cultivars, breeds and artisan methods. Our Eat Lancet actually seeks to replace that extraordinary culinary richness and natural biodiversity with a top-down, we know what's best for you, universal diet. And all my instincts and all my professional experience as a food writer make me rebel against this. Now, I can illustrate this gut feeling with recipes from my own bookshelves. Malaysian beef rendang, <coughs> French cassoulet, Lancashire hot pot. I could go on. I won't because you can see where I'm going with this. Are we seriously prepared to throw out these recipes to give them pariah status because they are plant-based? I also flick through all the articles I book, uh, all the articles and books I've written over the years, and I think of all the fabulous farmers and food producers I've profiled in them. And I know that you, you here tonight, many of you will have written similar pieces. I think about people like Bob Kennard, who has been tirelessly championing, championing, who has tirelessly championed mutton, and fought to keep small local abattoirs open. I'm thinking of Selena and Humphrey Arrington, who fought and ultimately win a punishing legal battle for raw milk cheese. I think of these amazing people, genuine food heroes, and I know right away that I support them and their products. We food writers should be on the same side as them. I am absolutely not prepared to reject them, to tell them that the unique foods that they produce are now so much at odds with plant-based orthodoxy that they might as well retire because the writing is on the wall for them. Just last, one last quick point before I go. For three decades I've campaigned against factory farm foods and I've asked people to boycott them. And my view has been that they have no place in any aware ethical diet. And I've written two books, um, The Food We Eat and What To Eat, and that's my contribution to try and help people find what I consider to be ethical, thoughtful foods. But now I'm running out of patience with plant-based proponents, like George Monbiot and Philip Limbury at Compassion and World Farming, who use the worst examples of factory farming as a broad brush, brush with which to smear all livestock farming. Now, I expect this from extremist vegan organisations that do not seem to me to have any hands-on experience or in-depth knowledge of food production, be it animal or otherwise. They are tunnel-visioned activists who have swallowed hook, line and sinker, the generic, unqualified lies and distortions they picked up online. But from George and Philip, though, if I'm honest, I find such crude arguments intellectually dishonest. They should know better. And when I hear them promoting as dietary saviours the most ultra-processed, fake, food-like products, creations made by corporations that have already exerted a malign influence on what we eat, I cannot help but think that unlike us food writers, they aren't actually much interested in food per se. Yet there is a danger that living, breathing food cultures and the amazing people who create them could become casualties of their highly polarising emotional arguments. So in conclusion, what am I saying? S simply that I want to continue to eat the way I've been eating all my life, the way my ancestors ate before me. That is, I want to enjoy a nutritious, omnivore diet. I have no intentions of cutting out any food group apart from ultra-processed techno food. I will continue to base my diet on carefully sourced ethically produced food and put the countries, put the ingredients that my country is best at producing at the heart of what I eat. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
the Old St. James Bible and the Old Testament, those four words, old flesh is grass. You know, in the end, it all came out of the plants or crew or whatever in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, sea. Are you ready, Patrick? Our next speaker is Patrick Holden, who's uh, Chief Executive of the Sustainable Food Trust. Uh, was director of the Soil Association for many years and has an organic farm in Wales. Producing, and I'm going to start you now. Thank you. Can I see that as I go on? Thank you very much. Um, just to start to say, I agree with every syllable of what Joanna has just said, and I'm going to pick up on one of her themes. I believe, in answer to the question, what should I eat to be sustainable and healthy, uh, the answer is we should align our future diets to the productive capacity of the farming systems under sustainable management as near as reasonably possible to where we live, whether it's region or country. And to do that, we need to be able to differentiate between the farming systems and the livestock products which are part of the solution and part of the problem. And we need to do the same thing with the plant products. And in my opinion, uh, the, that narrative, the narrative which I share with Joanna, is under threat. We don't have one crisis, which is, as everybody agrees, and all these recently published reports uh, argue, right in the premise sections, we, are, we have maybe 10 or 15 years to take action to transform our future food and farming systems. We're going to avoid irreversible climate change, catastrophic loss of biodiversity, maybe descent into conflict and all the things that, you know, are, um, mentioned in various books about, you know, what's the guy called? Um, collapse. Um, Jared Diamond. Jared Diamond, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we also have another crisis, which is the response of mainly the academics and this succession of reports. There are up to 40 of them that have been published in the last few years, and only one of them, in my opinion, that's the Idri report, which has got a French pedigree, is remotely on on, on, on Line, aligned to what I believe actually needs to happen. But let's be honest about this. These reports and media coverage, the most recent of which was this Game Changer program, which is on Netflix at the moment. And the reason I know about this is because I've got a 14-year-old son called Harry, who's not particularly interested in the sustainable farming practices on my farm, I can assure you, because he's 14. I walk into the sitting room on Sunday, and I hear Tim Land's voice. I think, hello, hello, hello. Um, what's, what's he watching? I can't believe he's watching Tim Land. It turns out he's watching Game Changer. I said, why are you watching this? He said, it's recommended. I think that is something very meaningful. By Arnold Schwarzenegger. And it's, it's a propaganda program about not just plant-based diets, vegan diets. And Tim's soundbite, which he hasn't yet heard, apparently he was filmed for three hours, was if you want to do the right thing by climate change, Eat, give up as, eating as much meat and dairy products as you possibly can, and that's the direction you need to go in. I thought, my God, and I want to say, Tim's a good friend of mine, I've known him for 30 plus years, entirely the same, 40, entirely the same. So what I'm about to say is fundamentally challenging what they are doing, because both Tim and Tara are co-authors of the Lancet Report, 37 authors, not one of them, with a possible exception, I want to argue that later with Tim, had knowledge of agricultural practice. And I'm a practitioner, and so I think I know what works and what doesn't work. And I can assure you that what works in terms of alignment with sustainable farming practices is farming with the grain of nature, a mixed farming system which builds soil fertility through um, clover and grass, grazed by ruminant animals, yes, ruminant animals, and those ruminant animals, mainly grass-fed, uh, is what we should eat if we want to support the transition to truly sustainable farming and food systems. And that is not happening. We have a crisis on our hands and we need you to get behind advising the highly confused public, confused as they are by the results of all these aforementioned reports, as to what they should do in response. And this need to differentiate between the livestock products which are part of the problem and those which are part of the solution is the very core of it. So what would my solution be in the United Kingdom? Because I agree with Joanna, this is what we should do. We should eat, we should give up eating um, industrial chicken altogether and pork and mega dairy farms. By the way, 50% of all the milk now which you buy at supermarkets get, comes from cows which never get outside. I just learned that from a uh, a dairy farmer, a friend of mine the other day. It's only 25% of the herds, 50% of the milk. So we should give up and, and 
avoid buying those products. But con conversely, we must buy the sustainably produced, mainly grass-fed beef, lamb, and dairy products upon which this nation, as Joanna just said again, is best at producing. We are a nation of two-thirds grass, and that grassland is, can only be turned into food uh, by, with room for animals. And then, another story, the arable east, farmers that have been asset stripping the soil fertility uh, of the east of England for 60 or 70 years. They're running out of soil carbon, and they're all thinking, they know this, and they're thinking, what can I do? And I was just on a very large farm in Berwickshire the other day, thousands of acres, and they know that the best thing to do would be to go into mixed farming. Are they going to do that? No, they're not, because the decline in meat sales as a result of this propaganda, which is coming out of all these programmes and these reports, is catastrophic for the UK livestock industry. 15% decline in beef sales in the last year. Abel and coal, 40% decline, apparently in beef consumption. So this is getting traction. I've just been in a vegan debate at the Excel Center with uh, Heather Mills. Three vegans and me. We didn't fall out. But it's, it's, it, we have a, an emergency on our hands. And I have to say, Tim and Tara are perpetuating this shift towards plant-based diets. And I think it is moving directly away from the kind of farming systems that Joanna has described that we need to support in this country. Of course, the diet that we need to eat to be healthy and sustainable would be different in different countries. But in the United Kingdom, if we went completely sustainable, grain production would halve, which is okay because half the grain we produce is fed to animals, mainly chickens and pigs and intensive dairy cows. So we'd have to give up that and go back to when I was a child in the 50s when chicken was an occasional treat because grain is ecologically expensive to produce. And mixed farming would prevail, which would mean we could grow lots of vegetables, but as part of a rotation, not in these dreadful vegetable monocultures of the eastern counties, which are depleting the vegetables and the fruits we eat of micronutrients because they're not growing in a proper rotation with livestock. So I'm going to use the rest of my time now, it won't take any longer, is to just show you my farm story because this is about real farming on the ground. So I'm going to show you what a mixed farm looks like in Wales. I can get this right. Can somebody? Can somebody get the mix? Yeah, go. Right, okay. Okay, so I'm going to skip over this. I'm just going to show you a pictorial picture. I'm sorry about this, but because I'm just. This is. I got there in 73, that's me on a tractor. I was back to that, a hippie farmer from, from London. Um, we started milking cows in 73 with churns. Here's me with my first one, same year. Here's the farm today. It's 300 acres. We have a crop rotation on the best land. That's a grain store, a silage shed, a cheese store, and farm buildings in the back room. There it is again. Here's our dairy cows. We have a herd of 80 dairy cows, a native breed because they're thrifty and converting clover and grass into milk from this pasture. Two thirds of our land couldn't really grow arable crops, maybe even more than that because it's too, the soils are too thin, the rainfall's too high, too steep, that sort of stuff. And this is a lot of Western Britain. Western Britain. We are practicing holistic grazing because that way you can build soil carbon. The future of civilization on this planet will depend on our capacity to build up soil, to increase soil building. We can do that by regenerative holistic grazing practices. It requires tracks, we've laid a mile, electric fencing, and water systems. Uh, here's the clover grass that our cows thrive on, producing delicious milk. You are what you eat, eats. That's our cows. If you, and we haven't had a single case of clinical mastitis in our dairy herd for a year. Tell that to another dairy farmer. That's impressive. That's because the cows are healthy because they're eating good food. There are our cows, there's more. That's dandelions. It's amazing what can coexist with a pasture when you don't use nitrogen fertilizer. We've not used a kilogram for 46 years, nor have we used any pesticides. This system works. More clover and grass, uh, red clover, uh, nitrogen fixer, silage, uh, tedding in the that's we we David Attenborough who is advising us not to eat red meat he's he's right on plastics I love David Attenborough but he's wrong on red meat just to call it out um, 
That is our clamp, which we just put up because we wanted to give up plastic, not entirely as you see from the side sheets, but that's nothing compared to what we used to use with big bales. Uh, we plough the fields and scatter, we grow oats, peas and barley in a mix, there's the peas mixed in, we, we, we combine that and turn it into a cow muesli. This is the circular economy, our commitment is to produce as much food as we can with a completely circular system, minimising our use of non rural inputs. This is what we should be doing with every farm in the land, or a variation on that theme. This is the circular economy. This is feeding ourselves for road land. This is soil building. There's the straw. We're self-sufficient in many. There's the grain in the silo that we just put up with the grant from the Welsh Assembly Government. Here's biodiversity. That's coppicing. It's amazing the resilience of nature when you just you know, allow wild plants to come outside places. There's our milking parlour. Actually, actually, Rachel's dairy is all milking parlour. And there we suckle all our heifer cows, our nurse cows, because we care about cows, we love them. And they're healthier if you suckle them and you don't feed them on buckets. There's our have our cheese, have our cheese, uh, if you want to follow us on Instagram. Oh, there is some later. Oh my god, that's lovely. Uh, it's delicious. Uh, there it is, I'm going to finish in a minute. Uh, grading it. There's the vat, that used to be Montgomery's vat before they expanded. They're not farming, they're farming quite intensively, and that's an irony of the cheese world, that too many of the cheese producers are not farming sustainably. I'm not a criticism of Montgomery's, I'm just saying. Carrots, I used to be a carrot grower. One year in seven, as part of a rotation, we had to stop growing carrots because all the pack houses in the west of Britain were closed down by the supermarkets who have adopted this policy of category management which means that the growers in the west of England, Wales, can't get their produce to pack houses, so they have to give up. This is, the, the same story is playing out with, with slaughterhouses, meat packing plants, everything. It's destroyed the localised food systems which we need to replace once we've got. I have to stop because uh, I've run out of time. This is barely illegal, probably illegal actually, but we're eating the stuff. So we, have, we, we kill our veal animals, rose veal, and we eat them ourselves, and we want to find a market in London. If anybody wants to buy our veal animals or knows of a connection, please help me out this. And there's a pond biodiversity, that's a frog tadpoles, all the others beautiful, butterflies take, I took those photographs of butterflies on the farm. Nature can coexist with farming in harmony with nature, that's the message there. We have farm people on our farm, we won't develop farms and cultural centre. That's the head of the Welsh Government Agricultural Policy team who spent a day on our farm and they're going to introduce uh, incentives for sustainable farming throughout Wales with an annual sustainability audit. It's amazing. I'll have to stop there because you know those are my influences. Uh, there's more to say. Thank you. is going to take on that challenge now. Uh, she's at the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford, uh, fellow of the Oxford Martin School and uh, runs the uh, Food Climate Research Network which she set up in 2005. Um, can you manage eight minutes? Thank you very much. Yes, um, and I am that painted as species, one of the co-authors of the Lancet reports, and a lacto ovo vegetarian who is vegan two days a week. Um, and I'm going to um, the the discussion, you know, was really familiar because it reminded me of the Boris versus Jeremy debate last night, which was characterised by oppositionalism and simplistic thinking. Now, I really think that food is really messy and difficult, and the ways forward are going to be messy, difficult, compromised. And I don't think we're always going to get what we want, but we might get, if we try, what we need. So I just want to remind you of some of the problems. We have a food system that contributes to coming up for 30% of global emissions, the food system uses about 40% of the usable Earth's surface. Now, land used for agriculture is land that is not available for biodiversity or only partially available in very compromised form. The food system is the main driver of biodiversity loss and species extinction. And our production of animal products is a main user of the land which in turn drives that biodiversity loss, both directly through deforestation and land clearance and indirectly through the, uh, the ploughing up of, 
uh, pastures um, for, for the grain of grain crops to feed animals. We have fish stocks fully or over exploited. It goes on, it goes on. We have people being malnourished in every single way possible. The, the problems of excess, of insufficiency, and inadequacy. It goes on. So I was asked four, to, to answer four questions this evening. One is, what do I eat? One is, what should we eat? Third is, how should we get there? And fourth, some top tips for food writers. So I will try and go there. Now, this is what I eat. It's well, I did it last night. I'm not going to get any boards on my Instagram to have, which I don't actually have. That on the left hand corner is glop. It's soup. And it pretty much exemplifies the way I eat, which is a very compromised way. So half of what's in that soup is from Oddbox, which is one of these food surplus boxes. And at the moment, there's a lot of kale. So I disguised it with other stuff, which includes butternut squash from Tesco's. And in it, there is, I've thinned it out with oh, a bit of sherry, quite cheap sherry. Um, there's some soy milk, because half the time I drink soy milk, half the time I drink milk milk. And it also has some whey in it, because I make my own yogurt, and then I strain it, and I have loads and loads of whey, which I need to get rid of. So I put it in my suit, I put it in everything. I really recommend it. There should be a free book in it. There are lots of title options there. Also, just very unclassy, bog standard supermarket bread, because I'm not going to spend three pounds with gin and loaf of bread. Um, and then my two favourite kinds of chocolate, recommended eating in combination, 90% um, plus calories, whole nut. So that's what I eat, and it's, it's a compromise. But generally speaking, it's trying to cut down on my consumption of animal products, diversify my diet, be a bit practical. So what should we eat? Well, who's the we, and to what extent am I an autonomous agent? This is what influences my consumption patterns. And it's so complicated. It's everything from trade arrangements that I don't understand to to actually millennia of technological developments, investment more recently in research and development, um, local and international policies, demographic change. I would like to remind you that we are going to be 10 million people on the planet in 2050. We can't all optimise our diets. We're going to have to have good enough diets, and that might require a bit of supplementation here and there as well as all the aspects of agribusiness power, that's a massive, massive, great issue. Who defines what it is that we eat? Then you've got your intermediary things to do with societal norms, values, taboo, the fact that we eat breakfast because in our culture we eat breakfast, or that, that crisps are available because in our society snacking is a thing. Uh, price, availability, affordability, marketing, what's legal, what's available, and then the more kind of mess, sort of smaller, the areas where you as food writers can probably influence things like personal preferences and norms, education, all that sort of thing, plus our family norms, our biological makeup, and then, you know, that's what we, that, that, those are the influences on our consumption. And so to this question of what should we eat, I think we have to bring our values and our beliefs, and we have to decide who it is who tells us what, whose views count. And we are in a room here of highly educated, largely female um, food writers who really care about food, and they care about the, certain, the qualities and the characteristics of food. Those values are not as important to other people for all sorts of reasons, some of which are really good reasons, they're busy getting on with their lives. They might be writing novels. They might be doctors. They might be too busy working three jobs to think about food. They have other priorities. The discussions about food, particularly within the food writing community, are, I think, with respect, riddled with class assumptions. <coughs> Speaking as a member of the educated upper middle classes, so I am kind of as criminally involved in all this, but I think there's a very strong class dimension running through this. So we have to consider our values and be open to sharing how other people bring their own beliefs and priorities to discussions. Then we come to the question of livestock and what we do with it. So I just want to remind you about the fact that livestock are a contributor to the problem of climate change and major user of land. 
This is where the Lancet report comes in. I don't recognise your characterisation of that report, and I don't actually agree with everything that it said. But the starting point for that is 10 million people, many of people whose diets are appalling. They are largely grain or tuber based. The proportions are all wrong. I lived in India, I've lived in there for about a year and a half, and the first thing that struck me was the fact that people eat rice and then a bit of flavouring, which might be dull. Hardly any vegetables. What's this plant-based diet? There isn't a plant-based diet. It's rice. So the balance is wrong. So what Eat Lancet does is it raises the proportion of vegetables and it lowers the proportion of grains. Perhaps not as much as Joanna might like, but it's a compromise. And the starting point in a country like the UK or the US is a diet where people are eating loads of meat, loads of really crappy meat, and not very many vegetables at all. We don't eat our, our five day. So you're kind of shifting up and shifting down a bit, and you're making something that more or less fits because there's a quite a lot of range in there, and it, the, that, those sorts of rough proportions are suited to a whole range of different cooking cultures. So here are some food options, and again, the future is messy. It's not going to be simple, and there isn't going to be a single solution. And I think people come to these questions with different with sort of different values. So, so here you've got Patrick Holden's um, kind of, the idea of the, the ruminant being this kind of miraculous something or not, something from nothing animal that recycles nutrients um, and, 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 and uh, you, you get food out of it. For other people, you could say, well, that's a massive use of space that could be used for rewilding and, and you're producing all that methane. And by the way, you're also, in, if, if you're applying that to a population of 10 million people, you're going to have to be clearing quite a lot of land, which means trees going up in smoke, which means irrevocable carbon dioxide loss into the atmosphere. So, discuss. The other way is the kind of right, the chicken's really efficient, really good feed conversion efficient. <coughs> Personally, I, this, this to me is abhorrent. I can't, I, can't, um, I can't accept that kind of commoditization of life scenario. At the same time, you look at people in sub-Saharan Africa whose kids are getting absolutely nothing to eat. And they're being pushed into urban areas and they still get nothing to eat. And that meat, that animal protein can make a really important difference to the well-being of those children. And it's cheap. It's cheaper than the option. So I can see where they're coming from. The plant-based diet, if you're imaginative, if you're a genius, it's if you're using less land, you're producing fewer emissions, and you're getting a balanced uh, 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 food that is kind of funky, which is good enough for health. Other people might say that's just meager, it's not enough, it's deficient, and so forth. Finally, we have the artificial meat. I just want to ask, okay, it's unnatural, blah, blah, blah. Hands up, who's using contraception right now? Anyone? <laughs> no one who has? You know, we are creatures of science, you know? We have to think about these things. So, what should we eat now? I haven't got time. Not too much, more plants, less meat than dairy. Finally, I just wanted to... Oh, I was going to have a rant about what to write. Please don't suggest putting a head of garlic in the oven for 40 minutes and roasting it. Please suggest pressure cookers, or preheating the oven for half an hour, or say that you've got a recipe involving kale and you're using 50 grams of it. What good is that to me? And also, if you're doing Father's Day's recipes, can they not be based? And please don't moralise, and there's more to life than food, and the environment is bigger than that, and we have to think about our flights, our energy efficiency in the home, we have to think of the lot. And finally, that's my daughter, and I have to say this, because this is the birthday cake, she turned 18, and this is the birthday I make from every year, I can do it with my eyes shut, it's the standard whisk sponge, I need the paper, and it's a miracle of technological ingenuity. Sometimes you think about it, the chill chain. I always know that my cream is not going to be off, that my eggs are not going to be off. I know that the fat content of my cream is going to support the whisking of it. I can use an electric whisk, not forks, which means that it's a really easy cake to make. It's not, it's not this massive, massive great luxury. Um, I have clocks all over my kitchen, in the microwave, in the oven, so I know how to time it. I know that my oven is going to stick to 170 degrees. Um, I, I've got cameras in the cake even though I've got lights. You know, we
we are all cyborgs now. We are fundamentally <coughs> intertwined with our technologies. And the idea of going back to nature, I think we need to move forward in a critical and a sceptical way. And I think we need to not simplify. Anyway, that's my right. <laughs> Thank you very much. And finally, from the panel, uh, never get your chance. Uh, I'm here Hey, it's Tim Lang, Professor of Food Policy, uh, someone I've known for a very long time, 40 years plus, I think. Uh, once farm in uh, the hills uh, in the Pennines, where I live, but who doesn't anymore? He lives in London. On you go, Tim. <laughs> Just coming in the field and angle section. Um, thank you. Um, firstly, let me take a bit of heat out of it by saying there are some overlaps, I think, across us all. Um, there are conflicting messages. It's complex. I agree with Tara. There are lots of um, zigzags. There's no straight lines in this, as you probably realise. Um, I think, I bet all of us on the panel agree there is a really big danger of the rise and rise of overprocessed foods. I mean, I know Joanna rightly pillories the vegan overprocessed foods, and I agree with that, Joanna, completely. It's a ghastly sort of profiteering. It's basically Californian software money going looking for where to spend its billions. Um, uh, also, I think we agree, and I agree with Patrick. Farming is under threat. I think there's a, a really tricky time at the moment, particularly in Britain, but not just everywhere, not just Britain, everywhere. Farming is in a really, really difficult time. Uh, I actually agree, personally I agree with Patrick's analysis of rotation farming. If you're going to have animals, and there are places certainly where only animals can work. I've never been to Mongolia, but uh, a very excellent and brilliant PhD student of mine worked there for many years, so I learned fair amount about it through him. Um, you can't grow vegetables in Mongolia. It's quite tricky, but you can actually get things off the land through through the yak. Um, they're fantastic. So I don't think, and now just to slightly defend the Lancet, which I, I really would like you to have a look at, it's a modeling exercise. Um, I mean, it's raised a storm, actually, which we did not expect, um, purely because it, it actually and here I'll be very pompous academic, um, it's basically restated the Malthusian problem. Uh, Tara asked how many of you use contraception. I have in the past, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I had prostate cancer, so my prostate was removed, so uh, I don't need uh, contraception anymore. Um, uh, how many of you read Malthus? How many of you read Malthus? Oh, uh, uh, my, my students accepted, or, <laughs> or ex-students. Um, basically what the e Lancet Commission was asked by the editor of the Lancet, uh, Richard Horton, um, to do was, and there were 17 of us actually, it turned into 37 because we uh, got um, sort of postdocs and people to work, so it became a very big team. We were asked to basically consider the Malthusian problem. Would it be possible on current trends to uh, feed 10 million people, which is the median assessment of the UN's Department of Population, uh, by 2050? And the answer I thought was no, uh, but in fact it was yes if there was a dramatic change in diet from the current norms. Uh, so good so far. The extra bit of the Malthusian problem that we were asked to do was could we feed the world 9 billion, 10 billion people by 2050 without destroying the environment? In other words, pushing ecosystems, biodiversity loss, land use, climate change emissions, water, we actually did study but we didn't mainline on it. And the answer was only by changing the diet dramatically. Now that did not mean Tara was absolutely right. The, the, so the, the huh, very amusing sort of characterization of the Lancet. It, it was not saying everyone should eat the same everywhere. Let's be absolutely clear. There were people on the committee, in fact, Patrick, I keep on telling you to stop this. Well, Willett comes from the farming family. Johan Rockström has a small holding. 
There are actually a lot of people, the IFPRI, FAOs, farming specialists from farming backgrounds, who do nothing to do with farming, but aren't actually milking cows in the morning like Patrick is. So Patrick sets his bar very high there. We, we know each other very well, so don't worry about the jousting. Um, the Malthusian problem can be resolved. It can be resolved, but it'll need to be changed. That's basically what the Lawrence was put out to do. Now, like Tara, I'm going to answer the, the, questions, the questions that we were asked to do. What do I eat now? I eat mostly, I used to be a Welsh black pedigree cattle breeder. I have bred and killed pigs, poultry, you name it, all of them. Um, I gave it up uh, uh, all with mad cow disease in protest, in protest. Uh, to John Gummer and just not gone back to it. Um, I eat fish less and less. <coughs> I eat uh, uh, oily fish. I follow the MSC, the redistribution guidelines on that. Um, but let me just tell you, even if you follow the marine stewardship guidelines, fish runs out if 9 million do it. Fish is the biggest source. It's not meat that we should be arguing about. It's fish, actually. Fish is the really big, <coughs> tricky one. And yet here we are in Britain, this very strange, very interesting country that we live in and, uh, and like. Um, uh, we actually don't really know what a British diet is. It's varied. Any of you read <coughs> Colin Spencer's lovely book? Yes, yeah, quite a few of you. I mean, Colin raised that question very early on about you know, the traditions. What did the British eat? The answer was it was very varied, actually. And exactly as uh, uh, we said in the Lancet, it's divided by class and income, basically. It's an income-related thing, eating. Um, <coughs> what should we be eating now? Um, less food in Britain. <laughs> it's actually the number one. Number two is less waste, it's the biggest source of uh, the stupid things we do. Um, definitely, again, Patrick and I would agree, and Joanna, we've known each other all a long time, we're on the same side on this, better quality. The problem is how do you define quality, what is quality? Um, we've got to basically eat, even within Britain, I've been just produced a new book about to come, well, about to come out with Penguin called Feeding Britain, we basically, the main problem we've got in Britain is people below the, the average. It's a catastrophe of diet-related ill health in Britain. It's actually my number one concern, not what Eat Lads had talked about. Um, what are our priorities, I was asked to say? I think, um, well, we have got to, again, a point of uh, agreement with, I think, across all of us, I would suspect, well, I know Tara, well, but I don't know Christian, but I'd be very surprised, or not Christian very well. I'd be very surprised if we didn't agree the critical battle is actually about how we make the food. Uh, and it's not just what, but how. Not just what farming does, but how it does it. What Patrick was alluding to, the short hand these pesticides and fertilizers. <coughs> Those are critical issues, and I completely agreed with I think it was Patrick's throwaway remark, or was it Joanna, about horticulture. Intensive horticulture is terrible, but actually the biggest uses proportionately are gardeners. Gardeners are catas catastrophic in their use of agrochemicals. We've got to stop demonising farmers and do a lot more demonising of ourselves as gardeners. Um, what should we be doing? Well, my summary of all of these complicated things I don't know if any of you have seen the book I wrote with Pamela Mason, Sustainable Diets. Basically, we summarise the complexity. And I decided not to bring any slides, but I regret very much not bringing one, which I'll happily send to anyone. We summarised under six headings the, the problem of what in academic world we call the multi-criteria problem. Basically, food is complex. How do you make sense of that complexity? Well, we have to order it down and bring all these very complicated, very diverse criteria. And we, in our centre at City, we run under six headings. Quality, I don't think you can talk about food unless you talk about quality. What do we mean by that? Health, environment, economy, um, um, social and cultural issues. You know, you, there's no point telling people to eat meat in great slabs of subcontinent uh, of India. I was a child in India, so I'm quite
quite familiar with that. My first diet was basically um, a vegetarian Indian diet. Um, uh, and finally, the one that we never talk about, uh, but my book leads on actually, which is governance. The critical thing is we are not going to be able to do whatever change we want in the future unless we sort out the governments, how things are decided. For example, the Eat Well Guide at the moment I think is pathetic. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner there's a little bit about um, uh, please cut down on uh, red and processed meats. doesn't really explain why doesn't explain about fish particularly. I think we've got to get a grip, but that's where the how as well as what comes. How do we get there? I think I wrote down less attention on the specifics. I understand people demonizing the argument about meat. Meat is important, but it's not the only important thing actually. Inequalities is much more important, much, much more important. Um, uh, uh, what should guild members be saying? Well, I'm a guild member, I think, be try to negotiate the complexity. I've just been interviewed by a fellow guild member for a feature in the Guardian shortly. Uh, in fact, Joanna, I think, probably was as well. Um, I think we've got to make sure we don't just do simplistic thinking and saying, this is good, that's bad. We must actually be a bit more nuanced. That's why I think my six headings, or our six headings, become useful. If you're talking about health, always make sure. Have I thought about the cost? Have I talked about wages have I talk about there are multiple criteria involved in everything. Uh, secondly, I think what guild members have got to do very, very carefully indeed is focus on the national food strategy. How many of you are watching the national food strategy? Yeah, a few, great. This is going to be very important if the Tories are back uh, with an increased majority. Henry Dimbleby is running it as a full-time team at the department. DEFRA, it's plugging the gap between the Agriculture Bill and the Environment Bill. It's actually going to be the critical thing to address. So I, I wrote down, I'd really like Guild members to keep a critical but friendly eye on the National Food Strategy. I have to say I support it, by the way, I'm not being opposed to it. I know Henry Dumbledore, I've talked with him, but I think it's got to be watched very carefully for what it says. I would be nervous, Christian's probably not going to like me saying this, if it just said, the poor need to be taught how to cook better and then all the problems would go away. I would be outraged. I know Christian doesn't. And finally, uh, for Guild members, uh, prepare your, gird your loins for hormone-fed beef from America. Just prepare your, uh, gird your mental loins for that, because that's what's coming down the line. So we're going to actually have to defend Patrick very, 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 very vociferously. Um, and indeed argue why all farming should be like Patrick's farming, but that what, what that means is actually less meat and dairy. Thank you, Sam, and thank you everyone. It's your turn now, a lot of you as a position of the chair. He said, I two things, we, who is the we? There's a huge range of who it is in this country. I chair the Fabian Commission on Food and Poverty. We have hundreds of thousands of people who suffer severe household food insecurity in this country. So there's a wide range of people. And we've heard health, environment, social justice, cultural, locality. It's your turn. You can make comments, add ideas, or ask questions. And we'll give them a little chance at the end to respond. I've got a roving mic, which I think Sylvia is going to race around with. One, two, three. Lady at the back in red, uh, in black first, then, then in front, and then the red-headed guy. And the one behind it. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Becky Alexander and I write um, a local newspaper food column in Hertfordshire as well as other things. Um, my question is to Patrick really, is it actually possible to feed the UK following sustainable farming methods? Do we have the space? Hertfordshire has maybe three farms around it and there's a lot of us. Is it actually possible? Thank you. Remember that question. Come back later, Lady Fun. Um, you were saying that you can't just say that some people of the society should learn to cook, but I think that everyone needs to learn to cook. Oh yeah. And we need to great. do that in schools, and it's so so important. So um, yeah, everyone needs to learn to cook. Can I just clarify? I wasn't meaning we shouldn't learn to cook. Yeah. The, the answer to all the problems <coughs> that the National Food Strategy is going to address 
there is a, a real concern that cooking might feature very highly in it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll come up there. Hi, I'm Gavin Wren and I write around food policy. Now, the question is what should we eat now? What would happen if we changed the question to what will they eat next? Because that's a very different answer. We have no one in here from industry who is shaping what's, what is going to go out to consumers next. And as Tim just alluded to, what might be coming into our country next in the form of meat from America. So I think if we look at that differently, we might get a very different answer to what we've just heard from the panel. Hi, um, my name is Peter Greg from Piper's Farm down in Devon. Like Patrick, uh, we are farmers. Um, and we've spent 30 years building a business with the express intention of producing food we were happy to feed to our children. It's a very simple objective, but it certainly focuses your mind. I just want to pick up on a couple of things that Tara said. Um, there was a slide you put up showing some sheep, and I think the, uh, the caption under it was miraculous something from nothing. Um, you then suggested that going back to nature was rather a retrograde step, and uh, you implied that this really was a very complex argument. The point I simply want to make if I dig up a double handful of our farm, there are more bacteria in that single piece of our farm than there will be human beings on the planet in 2050. It isn't complicated. Nature gives us the most incredible way of building food. It's called photosynthesis. And the people who do the work are the bacteria and the mycorrhizal fungi. Please don't overcomplicate this. The issue is there has been no effort to distinguish and make more of the point Patrick was trying to say. Industrial systems of farming have evolved since the Second World War. They are rotten from top to bottom, those systems are flawed and completely unsustainable. By contrast, the simple principles of farming in harmony with nature would easily food feed a world population of 10 billion. And in answer to the point just raised now, could we feed the population of Britain from the resources we have in Britain? Absolutely without question. But it is traditional systems of farming in harmony with nature and harnessing the incredible, unbelievable resource that is nature. It's not complicated. Hello, uh, Phil Harris. Um, I wouldn't argue against that last point, but I think as food writers we should be uh, perhaps trying to change societal norms. And I also agree with Tara, this uh, class space and uh, the middle class uh, norm since the 60s uh, has, has been nature is best. Well, it's not always the case, I don't think. Uh, the, uh, I think uh, we should be praising artifice if it's the right artifice. It's ce celebrating human ingenuity not necessarily the industrial, industrial food system, but uh, I think, for instance, how in Chinese cuisine, artifice is celebrated, fish flavored aubergine, for instance, creating things from natural ingredients, but you have human artifice in there, and we shouldn't turn our back in that, we should celebrate our own ingenuity. Hi, um, my name is Nicole and I work um, in a charity called Chefs and Schools. And we go around schools and actually try and get kids in primary and secondary schools to understand where food comes from. And I've spent, I think, the last six years trying to get kids to butcher a chicken and to appreciate that this chicken, you know, is valuable. But my question is, I guess, and it, we work together, me and Joe actually started the charity together, but 
My question is, I think we spend so much energy on trying to get kids to understand that not every meal has to have meat, that I guess these conversations are really useful, but what teenagers are eating at the moment and what children in schools, you know, it's very far from what the conversations are today. We do spend most of our time trying to get that message across, so I guess it would be good to, to yeah, ask for any ideas or solutions to the problem, because I think we are faced by a problem that chicken is, should be on every meal. Thank you. More contributions? Way at the back. Uh, okay. Okay. Here we go. Any more? Can I see some more hands before we give them a chance? No, we give them a chance back. They'll never get a word in again. Uh, so um, Michelle Berry and Johnson. Uh, the, possibly the elephant in the room that we haven't actually looked at is the food industry here. Because um, we talk about processed food, which is a massive problem. We talk about terrible diets for, for children, which is a massive problem. We talk about uh, a large proportion of the population not being able to afford decent food, which is a massive problem. But the, the biggest obstacle possibly to, one of the biggest, but one of the massive obstacles here is the food industry, which is huge, which has a, a vested interest in processing food. Yeah. So where does that come into the equation? I've had a question that's appeared from the uh, magic of the streaming system. Education is critical. How should this be done, given the risks use focused on home economics, etc.? The younger generation is aware of the climate issues much better than their parents are. So how would you educate the older? Uh, I'll Google that's what. Generations. Generations, thank you. And that's throwing that in. Any more, any more things from the floor? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I've got you coming back to this. Thank you. Um, my name is Rachel Lovell. I'm a freelancer. I've recently done a couple of pieces with Farming Today and the Telegraph on bivalves and um, organisms lower down the, the food chain. What's your view on their role in sustainable food production? Thank you. Do we have any more? I'm going to abuse my position on this chair as well. So I think. Policy, who makes the rules is one of the key things, as Patrick was saying. It's how to control the risks and benefits. Who's got what power to control over to the action in this system? Uh, who carries the risks and who gets the benefits? Whether we look at health or environment, whether we think about our children or our grandchildren, because they're also going to carry some of the risks or the benefits from the decisions that we make today. And the policy environment is going to probably shift enormously. There's going to be a huge fight in the next few months, possibly years, over what kind of future this landscape in Britain and the kind of food we have and where it comes from is going to be. And that's something I think we also need to take into account over the generations. So, I will now give a chance back to, we go, do you want to start Patrick? Yeah. Go on. Um, who makes the rules? I think uh, John Westlake was at that last picture of my farm. He's the head of the policy team, the Welsh Government, who tried to redesign the common agricultural policy in relation to post-Brexit that happens. And he wants to support uh, sustainable farming, not stewardship, which is nature protection around the edge of otherwise intensive farming. And he said in a talk he gave at our farm uh, in September, he said, governments need to set the big picture because farmers are massively influenced by big picture uh, government intervention. But then the smaller detail needs to be set by you, know, you, by society, by NGOs, and by others. And I think that's basically right. And Tim's mentioned Henry Dibbleby, and I think he's got a huge um, play, role to play, but he's under a lot of, I imagine, interesting and conflicting pressures. And I'm, I'm not going to, I know Henry, I'm not going to hang my hat on the best possible outcome because he's been lobbied from all quarters. So, really, what you say what you write matters. Can we feed the UK sustainably? I agree with Peter that we can, but we have to change our diets. I agree with Tim and Tara, we'd have to eat a lot less meat, but it's the issue that I was raising before, which meat we need to eat less of, and which meat we need to eat more of. And I want to challenge Tim and Tara to say that this red meat, uh, anti-red meat advocacy is doing massive, massive damage because most of the red meat that we produce in this country is mainly grass-fed. It's not a clean bill of health. I mean, I'd be the first to say we need change. But basically, 
the Eat Lancet report recommends eating four times as much chicken in a, on a weekly basis than it does red meat. And red meat is defined as all ruminant meat, whether it's grain fed or grass fed, all pork and all processed meat. That is an intellectually dishonest and sloppy definition of red meat. Therefore, any conclusions of advocacy you make about red meat is flawed from the start because it's an inadequate de definition. I'd like to hear Tara and Tim comment on that. I'll leave yeah. that. Patrick, you really should read some of the stuff that I write because that's not quite what I say. I don't set up an opposition between red and white meat. I highlight the different problems associated with different kinds of livestock in different kinds of systems. It's a kind of horses for courses. With ruminants, you get one set of problems. With monogastrics, with your pigs and poultry, you get another set of problems. You get problems with feeding the, 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 the feeding of grains to livestock when you be eating grains themselves, you get the problems with the production systems associated with that, and you get problems with ruminants and the land take, and you get problems with the methane, which, by the way, with the rising rising meat ruminant populations, is, is still going to be a problem. So, so uh, and, and on the Eat Lancet report, you may have noticed that there was a box which highlighted, tried to make sense of some of this development, and it got put into the appendix. And that, that was not my doing. You're, you're, so I just want to make that point. Um, on, on the but point your messaging is dry, and Tim's messaging is... Mm -hmm. Don't personalise it, Patrick. Well, no, it, it is it, personal. It's not our messaging. All it's meat our messaging. of all kinds needs to be it. reduced. We've said it a million times. But that messaging is wrong. It's yes. right away. That's, right the that big picture is, your is not wrong. Yeah. Um, the the messaging. Wrong. Wait two minutes. Um, I don't I, want this to be spent into. I will give Tim a chance to speak, and then I'll give you a chance right. to speak. Please, thank you. I've, I've now forgotten what it is I'm supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> reducing meat. Reducing meat. Reducing meat. Uh, look, we can demonise, take great pleasure in demonising Eat Lancet. It does me a great, I'm nearly 72 and I'm delighted to be demonised in my old age. Because I was in all my youth and I became too respectable. So just bring it on. But let me just be very clear. Eat Lancet is but the latest of 30 years a rising concern about excess meat consumption. It just is. That's the way it is. We might not like it, but that's the way it is. That's where all the data point. And, and less we've got doesn't to, mean nothing. Less that's doesn't mean nothing, thing. exactly. And, but I, I do agree, and I'm very glad that Tara said it, and I'm glad I've said it privately to Patrick, so I'll say it here. Um, I too am slightly at odds with the Eat Lancet in terms of red meat, bad, suddenly white meat, good. Implication. It's not what the report said. But there is a fundamental issue that we have to get our heads around. They're slow converters. And this is an issue about land use, climate change emissions. You may groan, Joanna, but it's true. You can't go against all of it. <laughs> I'm an ex-bloody Welsh black. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a cattle breeder and knows absolutely cattle are very good at converting grass and putting shit back and converting it and putting carbon back in the soil and breeding the bacteria. Everything you said, Peter, is absolutely right. But if the population of animals continues to grow at the scale we're at, it doesn't add up. Whatever the system. Whatever the system. That's just Whatever the system, we also need to think even about. organic, I'm an ex-organic right. producer, um, we have to go it. beyond organic. We call it, in my world, beyond organic. It's not I going against organic, it's beyond organic. I said that your messaging was wrong, and I think the root of the problem is that you generalise. Yes. Um, you talk in global generalities, and that is absolute nonsense. You have to look at what the capacity of each country is yes. and what it's going to be growing. So when I hear this, excuse me, can I finish? Uh, when I hear this generalised, we should all eat, eat less meat, that, we, unless it's unqualified by very overweight Americans who eat burgers for breakfast, lunch and dinner, it should be qualified. And I'd like to point out, I need, in this country, I'm talking about this country, a lot of people who eat no red meat I meet a lot of young women who are almost certainly deficient in iron and vitamin B12 
who think they're eating a healthy diet because of this, an this anti-meat narrative. I want to pick up a few things. Michelle Berry, Dale Johnson made a very important point about the processed food industry. Big food loves plant-based. It can make so much money out of it because what it already puts in its products is lots of highly processed carbohydrates, additives, uh, colorings, flavorings, etc. And it's just the license to print money. It's much, much more profitable than animal foods. Um, the National Food Strategy, by the way, again, uh, don't hold your breath. Uh, the chairman of Greg's, uh, the, the takeaway chain, is on it. Unilever, uh, the Pesticide Society uh, Association, which now call themselves Crop Protection mm -hmm. Society. So it's business as usual. On the question of this idea that um, it's to be interested in natural as some kind of middle class obsession and you're being very classist, I point out that only in Britain do you get the attitude that good food for everyone is a middle class or upper class obsession. And you know what, we cannot cure the ills of, food, of poverty by food. Uh, there are three elements as I see it into being able to afford good food. You need a living wage, you need affordable housing, and you need a benefit system that helps people when they haven't got enough money. And those are political issues, and you know what way to vote. Yeah. If that really concerns you, that cannot be cured by the fish system. Finally, on bivalves. From what my research on bivalves suggests is that they're really very sustainable. Oysters, mussels, um, they seem to be carbon neutral. Uh, I haven't looked at it for a while, but that was um, what I, I found when I looked at it. Thank you. Now I'm going to give it to Tara and finally the very patient and quiet to date, Christian. Right, okay, quickly on bivalves, they seem like a good thing. The only thing to think about is also the refrigeration, there's quite a lot of refrigeration, and if you're getting them from one place to another, you're actually carrying a lot of shell with you, which ends up having to find a use somewhere. So that's just one thing. Um, on the nature thing, I'm not this great big hater of nature, far from it. I'm simply trying to point out that you could work with nature, but sometimes give it a helping hand. And also, you know, don't assume that if it's natural, it must be good. There was a study done by the um, Swiss Organic Institute, actually, just a few years back. I know the people who, who did it, they're very good. Um, and they, um, they figured out that yes, organic, uh, an organic food system can indeed feed the world nutritiously and effectively, but our consumption of animal products would need to decline very, very substantially. That's the point. We're going to have to do it. There are no free lunches, mm. and, and uh, I guess that's the case. On the food industry, with its great big vegan agenda, I think the food industry's agenda is the food industry. It wants to sell us food. What it wants to, it doesn't really care what it sells us. If veganism is the flavour of the moment, great, get on that bandwagon. If something else is on the flavour of the moment, get on that bandwagon too. So I don't think there's an intrinsic synergy between veganism and, and the food industry. Um, and by the way, they're not trying to sell us less meat. <coughs> Far from it. Um, and, 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 I, and I think this links to a much wider point. What I was trying to say very inarticulately in, in my talk was that it's not just about food. The issue is consumption. And we have to think about the growth, the, 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 our, our economy, which is predicated on the idea of growth. If we eat less food, they're going to sell us more holidays. We have to think of the system. And generally speaking, less is going to be, have to be the way to go. Please pass it to Christian. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. So shall we stick with bivalves? Because that's a really exciting subject before we get down to the even bigger and loftier issues than being shellfish with it. Sorry. Love puns. Um, anyway, so as my, part of my job at NH Agri Food, which is eight of the universities of the north, looking at the food system of the north, and a thing that got me really excited three years ago when I started this role was bivalve. So you have a friend here. And I think the thing that you can think about is aquaculture in this country. Yeah. And if you think of the great rivers, we used to have a shipbuilding industry. We don't anymore. We used to have polluted rivers. In fact, our water quality on most of our main aquifers is really good now. 
but we don't have an aquaculture industry. So we could take the Clyde, we could take the Humber, we could take all those places with crippling unemployment, poverty, etc., and use bivalves and use aquaculture in terms of shellfish rather than other more problematic forms of fish feed based aquaculture. You could transform the north through that and get local jobs, which means you're not having a refrigeration problem. So there is a definite win in terms of bivalves. And if you actually look at kind of where those things are, they could feed a lot more of the protein and then have stuff for other sorts of farming there. So it's a win and you can have other things as well as mushroom farming from brewery waste. You can have a much bigger circular economy picture there. So just there before we go on to other things. But bivalves, I think we can all agree, let's eat some more of those. Yeah. Um, Unless you're allergic. Unless you're allergic, yeah, or you're kosher. You know, okay. Anyway, um, now I've dropped that. So the cooking and the skills thing. So as part of my work in N8 Agri-Food, we've been working with different community organisations in teaching low-income communities as well as other sorts of communities how to cook and looking at local cooking classes as a way to build community, similar to a community garden and things like that. So there's a definite place for cooking skills at any age, looking um, at building community and also teaching people fundamentals. If you teach people fundamentals of cookery, that's a win. And those things are going to change, as the person from Facebook said, in terms of they've changed the curriculum. But I've been working on a project for the last three years in London called Trifocal. There are nine boroughs in London that have rolled it out. Anybody here heard of Trifocal? Any? Yeah, a couple of people. Woo! Um, it's a brilliant project. It went into schools, it went into workplaces, and it went with a lot of different sorts of messages. But we made a curriculum for primary school kids to actually be involved in food in lots of different areas of the curriculum, not just home economics. So that was really exciting. Let's go to the long-term view. So if we think back to the farming system of pre-World War, we were facing a global hunger shortage then, and people got together and said, we need to feed the world. We have crippling hunger globally, we need to feed the world, and the Green Revolution happened. The Green Revolution has resulted in a lot of stuff as we were just talking about while some other stuff was happening earlier in the evening. But it's meant that people have been fed. And I agree, not, of all, not all of it has been positive, but there's been technical change. Chicken has become drastically cheaper. And one of my things is looking at the long-term view of how chicken has gone. And you can see, Chicken used to be a once a week thing. Or roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, as I said earlier. That used to be a Sunday evening thing. I that don't was know. a good thing. That was a good thing. And we want, we've all said we want to go back to having meat as a less often thing, higher quality meat. Yeah. But at the same time, you actually need to think about what the size of that is, when you're eating it, the amount of times you're going to be eating that sort of thing. And thinking about that on the long run, it's a little and often thing. So when you're thinking of the late eat lancet, think about roast beef and Yorkshire pudding in terms of it being one meal on a Sunday compared to having beef or lamb every night of the week, which is what some people in this country are having now. And the portion size, our average portion size of a piece of red or processed meat is 125 grams. That's the average portion size in this country for an average person in the National Diet and Nutrition Survey. The Eat Well plate, which is much maligned, is saying 90 grams, that's the recommended, cut down to 70 if you're, if you're able to. So there's differences there already, and that's meaning that people aren't eating enough fruits and vegetables and are eating larger portions of meat than necessary for health and sustainability reasons. So what can we do right now in this room is start designing recipes that look at how much meat or look at how much vegetables even you're putting in your recipes and also look at how you're cooking those things. Look at oven use, look at microwaves, look at all those other things. Those are things you guys can influence through your writing. Thanks. Well, I think if you could... As you can see, this could go on, couldn't it? <laughs> and it will go on. And hopefully, after this, you'll be able to talk to them over some nibbles and some drinks now. But also, maybe follow up later. If you've got questions, I hope everyone's open to being contacted. Uh, uh, use them. Uh, develop the arguments. We need to have the conversations in Britain about this. But as Tara said, and in the Food Ethics Council, we're working on a food citizenship project. These problems will not be solved by where we spend our money, because they're bigger than the consumer approach. It's about citizens and the role we take and the kind of country that we want. And it's more than just about food, as Tara did say. It's about the economy and all the other things. And you're a vital part of helping people connect what we eat, how we cook it, and how our 
the health and well-being of ourselves and our future young. So I'd like to thank all of the panel tonight for coming here and all of yourselves for coming as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, and of course I echo that thanks, and gosh, it always comes down to the economy, doesn't it? Um, but we have some lovely nibbles, and you have a brief period of time, you should be out by now. Uh, but it includes Havard, Patrick's Havard, uh, so I very much hope you'll enjoy that. There's some Stichelton cheese, some Brightwell ash, and Pastor as cheese from Oxfordshire. Uh, Justine has uh, gathered in some wonderful stuff from uh, Avon and Cole and Riverford. Um, and uh, there's some chocolate courtesy of the Academy to all good stuff, uh, craft chocolate. So, uh, and oh, wine, we have wine too. Um, so please grab your opportunity for a quick chat with our speakers, um, see if we can extract any simple solutions. But um, please enjoy yourselves for a brief while before heading home. Thank you. Thank you.